New York City, the city that never sleeps. Things were supposed to be different in our modern 1930s. Shining skyscrapers and subway cars to lead us into a grand future. Sure. So why was I in the same dingy office with a cheap desk and a cheaper secretary, paid to track cheating spouses? I had no more time for introspection. I grabbed my hat and gun. I slipped a flask into the pocket of my overcoat. I was ready to wade into the cesspool. It's time to review Deadline. So this is Deadline. Uh, this is a game uh, published by WizKids and designed by A.B. West and Dan Schnake. Dan Schnake? I don't know if that's how you pronounce his name, but uh, anyway. I hope it is to fit with the 1930s detective theme. So this is my first board game review. Uh, WizKids sent this to me, and I told them, as long as you are okay with uh, me being completely honest in my review, I will review any game you send. And so... Uh, WizKids will be sending some games, and uh, another company uh, has also reached out to me, and I told them the same thing. So basically, with these reviews, um, I don't claim to be an expert at all. This is really my personal opinion, uh, and I will talk about what I like and what I don't like. So if I like a game, I'll be honest, and if I don't like a game, I'll also be honest. Even if these companies, even if these companies send the games to me, I will give you my fully honest opinion. And the companies were totally cool with that, so I'm, I'm glad. Otherwise, I wouldn't have accepted the games. All right, anyway, so Deadline is a mystery game. Uh, it's a relatively new game from what I, I think came out this year. So that in itself uh, made it interesting to me because it's, you know, since it's a new game, you know, there's uh, not really that many reviews. I didn't look up reviews for it or anything. I was just like, let's just go into it blind. So let's just, let me just talk about kind of like uh, how you play it. So basically the concept of the game is you collect as many clues as you can before the deadline. Uh, there are these cases and uh, there's like 12 of them, I think, and you pick one. I mean, you start with the first one, I guess. Uh, your goal is to cover uncover as many clues as you can uh, before the deadline, or else you have to solve the mystery without all the clues. Um, but you're trying to get as many as you can. First of all, the art is great. Um, just looking at the cover, I was like, damn, that looks pretty dope. And then let's open up some of the components here. Here you got your character cards, like Pete Laurie and uh, Tracy Shachi, and like you get, so, uh, Art-wise, it's fantastic. Um, I love the sort of uh, 1930s kind of like detective film noir kind of vibe to it. Uh, it had a great atmosphere. All the little cards have like little captions on them, little uh, just little flavor texts uh, to give it a lot. And you get you have like little matchbooks, and I'll explain what these are in a second. But I thought these were a nice touch. You have bullets and you have a badge. So just going off components and art and atmosphere. A lot of fun. Again, I appreciate when a game kind of gives you a little extra, because it doesn't have to, but uh, a nice presentation is always nice. Um, this game reminded me of a game called Witness that I actually did not like that much. Uh, I know people like that game. Witness is a game where you like, you have to let your detectives and you're like whispering to each other, like, like, and then it's kind of like telephone, but detectives. And to me, it was just kind of frustrating and not that fun. <laughs> This felt like a much more successful witness to me. Um, and so the basic concept of the game is you're trying to uncover clues. So I'll pull one up, for example. This is a, this is Buckminster's apartment. And so uh, on the card, you see you have some symbols. You have cigarettes, uh, booze, a gun, and a hat. And what you're trying to do as a team is lay cards on top of each other so they overlap and display those symbols. Not necessarily in that order, as long as they're displaying them, that's fine. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So let's say we choose this clue, Buckminster's Apartment. Uh, and so the first player could go, okay, I'll play this card. And as you can see, this is the subway card. Uh, the, the actual name of the card doesn't really matter, but uh, it's got a hat, a money symbol, and a cigarette symbol. So already it's showing two of the symbols on the card. Um, and what someone else can do off of that is the next person's turn, they can play a card on top of it. And as long as the symbols match each other, you can put it on top. Now, as you can see, it's hat, money, cigarettes, and gun. Uh, and then you just kind of stem off of that. Then someone plays this card, the busy street card. They have matchbooks. I'll explain that uh, in a second. But basically, you overlay this on top of here. And voila, you have cigarette, gun, hat, and booze. They match. That means you get to pick up the clue and read the back. Picking up clues will give you a paragraph of text that kind of gives you more information. 
It also can help you unlock new clues and leads. And that's the basic overlapping mechanic. And you can also play cards um, on top of cards. Like it doesn't have to be like only on the sides of them. Because there are also cards that have blanks on them and blanks are wild things. So you could, I could put this here and since it, the uh, booze and the wild space go together, it goes totally fine. And then if I wanted to, um, if I had, and I don't know if I can, oh yes, here, here's your card. If I wanted to put a card, not necessarily on the side, but on top of them, I could do that as well. So cigarettes and the two wilds match up. So put that on top and so on and so forth. And so you're trying to match the symbols and pick up the clue. And that's really the main mechanic, but it gets a little more complicated than that because uh, every turn you have to take an action. And one action can be playing a card, right? But let's say you don't have any cards that can fit. That's where the matchbooks come into play. So you can see on these cards, they have matchbooks in the top left corner. Um, what that does is it flips over these little matchbooks so that they're lit. Um, and if you have lit matchbooks or matches, I guess, um, what you can do is flip, use them as kind of like currency for special actions. Uh, if you use two of them, you can draw a card. If you do three of them, you can remove a plot twist, which I'll explain. And if you remove four of them, you can remove two plot twists. Plot twists are basically cards that really fuck you up. But basically, you have to do three things. One of three things. Play a lead card, meaning one of the cards with the symbols. Use a detective ability. Oh, I mean, I'll, get, I'll get into that in a second. And use hot tips, like I just described. If you can't do that, you drop out. And if all three of you drop out, then you lose the clue. I mean, you don't lose the clue immediately, but you fail to get the clue. And you can try to get it again, but it's it's a waste of time and you'll start to if you fail too many times it's really going to hurt you each detective has their own special abilities so pete laurie uh he can discard his hand and draw back to his hand size tracer shot can take all the played lead cards into his hand uh phyllis marlena can draw three cards and immediately take another turn uh, and these abilities can only be triggered once per game which sounds brutal but there are ways to get refresh the abilities i mean they're not common but they are kind of like very like powerful abilities that uh um, you should only use if you absolutely need them um but i like that each detective has their own sort of special gimmick and then let's talk about the plot twist so plot twists are cards that really get you they really fuck you up and you have to play them in front of you this one says you're being tailed so before the round begins uh discard a lead card with a hat symbol meaning before you start going for the clue, you have to go in your hand, pick a card with a hat in it, and discard it. That kills you because the less cards you have to play with, the more likely it is you're going to have to drop out. So these kind of plot twist cards are there, to re and they really get, and that's kind of an issue that I'll talk about later, but they are really, really difficult to maneuver around. So ideally, you want to use the matchbooks to try to get rid of them so that you have an easier time. Now, every time you fail a clue, that's when these bullets come into play. These bullets are like lives to start with. You have three of these bullets, and each time you fail a clue, you lose a bullet. And that's fine. You know, losing a bullet is fine. But if you run out of bullets, then you start losing clues. And what I mean by that is each clue is numbered, and you start losing the highest number of clue in the stack. So if you, if, if you start really messing up, uh, you're gonna start losing clues and the more clues you lose uh, The harder it is to solve the mystery at the end of the case these plot twist cards are played when you drop out So if you manage if all of you manage to not drop out and play cards and get the clue you're safe But if people drop out they have to put down one plot twist card from their hand in front of them And that has the effect that really screws up everybody else you go through these clues trying to pick up as many as you can hope hopefully you don't uh, lose them. Uh, in our game, we played. We played the first case. So it was easy, so we managed to find every every clue without problems. I mean, it was it was a little tough, but we didn't lose any clues. And then, when all the clues are either taken or discarded, you read the case questions. So each case has a scenario that you read initially, which introduces the mystery. And then, when the game is done, you open up the questions book and you try to answer the questions that they give you. And you want to get as many right as possible. Now, there are bonus questions which can improve your score. Since we got all the clues, it was very easy to uh, answer all the questions, but there are difficulty levels as the cases go on. Uh, so I'm sure, you know, we were already having a little trouble trying to get all the clues and making sure we didn't lose any. So I'm sure that it, 
the difficulty steeps up a bit as it goes on. Fun co-op game. I I recommend this game. Uh, the atmosphere is very fun. We I play with a group where we're very prone to doing like silly little voices with the characters. So like, yeah, I was uh, which character was I? I forget. I was some like I'm a hard boiled detective and. Uh, um, my wife, uh, played a female character and basically did a Janet Snakehole voice from, uh, Parks and Recreation, uh, that kind of thing. So it was, it was really goofy, uh, and the atmosphere, the sort of flavor text you read and the, um, the, especially reading the clue, the back of the clues, because they have, like, little characters in them and it's, it's very film noir it's very fun. Here's a flaw of the game, and that comes with the plot twists. Now, I don't mind difficulty in games. Uh, but sometimes when you have a difficult, steep, not steep, this is not a super hard game, but, um, when you have a difficult mechanic plus bad luck, it can really mess you up. What I mean by that is that the plot twists are drawn from the regular, uh, clue pile. And so you basically draw up to your hand limit. Um, but if you draw like three or four of these in your hand, you're fucked. I mean, there's really literally nothing you can do about it. Now, maybe if there was a, maybe if there was a rule that was like, hey, you have more than half of your hand is plot twists, like when you draw, because um, if you drop out, uh, you discard your hand. If you don't drop out, you keep all your cards. But if there was some kind of rule that was like, okay, if you have no cards and you draw from the pile and you get more than half of them are plot twists, then, because some games do this, they let you uh, re redraw because it's like too much to deal with. Um, but there is no rule like that. So if you have three, four plot twists in your hand and like no clues, literally no clues to play, then you have no choice but to drop out. And bam, the plot twist goes down because that's the penalty for dropping out. It's really rough. And there were a couple times, and it could be attributed to maybe it wasn't shuffled that well, but we shuffled pretty well, I think. So I think it really just was kind of like bad, bad luck of the draw, where someone would get a really bad hand, and by bad hand, I don't mean like clues that don't work, because that's fine, that's workable. But getting a ton of plot twists in your hand, really, it's like there's not literally nothing you can do. Because the only way to discard cards is basically through abilities, I guess, and it's really not that easy to get rid of these cards. Like. Yeah, you can drop out and so that you can get rid of the plot twist, but still dropping out is still like a pretty, it's kind of a bummer if you have to do it right away. So maybe if there were a slightly easier way to get rid of bad cards, just nothing too, I don't want something too handholdy, but something that would just like make it a little bit easier just in the case of like a really unfortunate, nothing you can do hand. That is really the main significant issue, but that didn't really hamper our enjoyment of the game. Like, yeah, it was kind of a bummer, but we worked around it and we, you know, we problem solved and we could get around it. But I'm curious because, you know, with a, we played an easy case and on a hard case, I can imagine that really fucks you up if you just get draw four plot twists. So there's that. That's my one significant sort of uh, uh, gripe about the game. Um, there's also a finite number of cases because, you know, once you've solved the case, you know the solutions. But that's not an issue for me. Uh, it might be for, if you're a type of person who doesn't like that, like, wants to be able to play a game infinity times, then don't play this game. Um, there are 12 cases though, so that's 12 playthroughs, and honestly, there's not that many games you're gonna play 12 times. So, uh, 12 playthroughs is a lot. I think that's totally a reasonable number of, of cases for this game. Uh, and maybe they'll make more, uh, depending on how well this game does, maybe they'll release more cases, who knows. But for me, I mean, 11 more playthroughs, that's plenty. Like, I'm I'm satisfied with that. I would love to see how medium level and hard level cases get, because for us, since we managed to get all the clues, it really was not, I mean, it was literally like, we knew the answers exactly, because, <laughs> I mean, yeah, there was a little bit of, we kind of kind of have to figure it out, but you pretty much know the entire situation uh, if you have all the clues. Um, but if you lose some of the clues, it'd be very interesting to try to piece together as many answers as you can without all the pieces of the puzzle. And maybe some of the cases later get more complicated, so even if you have all the clues, it's tougher to solve. I don't know. All in all, it's a really fun game. I would recommend it. I do like co-op games a lot, 
and this one is very solid. It's definitely the first sort of mystery solving game that has really hit with me. Because like I said, Witness I did not enjoy. This really felt like Witness, but uh, a much more fun atmosphere. I, again, I'm a sucker for the atmosphere. I love the 1930s and film noir. I would definitely recommend Deadline. Um, unless you don't like Finite games, but if you don't have a problem with that, um, go for it. I would say, try it. Yeah, see?